New York, back to Riyadh. Thank you very much for joining me. The changing landscape, real estate, and development landscape for tourism. Really pleased with my panel here today. Greg O'Hara from the United States, Hussein Sajwani from the UAE, and Sami Sawaras, most recently, I believe, from Switzerland. Is that right? <laughs> I'm still Egyptian. <laughs> so let me get, first of all, a snapshot into what you think your lives will be. We heard from the ACOR CEO this morning, who told us he was expecting to lose 20% of his business travelers. Martin Sorrell told us business travel never coming back like it was. You all travel for work. You all use Zoom, I imagine. No one really loves it, but it is efficient. So briefly, how will business travel change for the three of you, Greg? Well, it, it's, it's part of our core business. Um, I'm the chairman of American Express Global Business Travel, which is probably the biggest business travel business, business travel company in the world. And so we're writing a recovery in business travel of 80% in 2019 and 2023. So uh, I agree with Sebastian, I usually do anyway, but I agree <laughs> with what Sebastian said this morning. Um, we think business travel will come off. We've got a pretty good beat on that because we can actually pull the companies that we, that we respond to. But I think it's gonna come off in different ways. The biggest thing you'll see, I think, is a, is a big decline over the next couple of years in, in large meetings and events. Mm -hmm. And that's usually responsible for about 30% of business travel. Okay, Hussein? I tend to agree. I think we see a drastic demand, uh, lower demand for the business travel. Uh, it will be there, but instead of me making 10 trips in a year, I probably make five or six and substitute the other three, four with Zoom. Uh, Zoom, as you said, has made a major factor, and uh, we were all uncomfortable to use this technology two years ago. Now, every day I have half a dozen Zooms, at least. So business travel will come down. I think the tourist uh, industry will see some shift from cities to more resort places. People more and more explored in the last one year uh, islands and resorts, and they find them more safe and more relaxed. Uh, so I think it's another good news for the uh, hotel industry from that point of view. If the business traveling comes down, if even tourism becomes less in the cities and more on the, the skirt of the city, there will be some challenges. Sammy, what do you think? What about this trend towards the longer stay? So you combine some business with maybe some family time. Well, we felt it already now in the past year in all our resorts that the average stay has uh, mushroomed. You know, people that came uh, booked for a week ended up staying for a month. Uh, people start booking two weeks, which is something they wouldn't do before. And it's uh, to a great extent thanks to the Zoom and the, mm -hmm. the likes of Zoom that makes it possible. But really also the culture has changed dramatically in a time, in a, in, in a short time, which I was not expecting, which is uh, that uh, if your colleague or your employee would tell you, I'm going to stay home these next two days and work from home, you would probably start thinking about replacement. <laughs> <laughs> now that it has been obligatory and it has been uh, commonly accepted, people don't look at it as a taboo to say, I don't need to be in the office. I can do it from Elguna. You know, I can be in a resort. My family is having a good time, and I'm sitting in the room uh, fixing things and writing memos and zooming left, right, and center. So the extent of stay is going to increase a lot. Okay. We feel it. Uh, but business travel, as the two colleagues said, uh, will suffer tremendously. I don't agree about conferences because the conference business has always been a networking opportunity for many people and a kind of a compensation for a lot of attendees. And I can imagine that many companies will continue to do it because it's a kind of a freebie that is not really officially a freebie and uh, people want that. Mm. So I think there will be a more of a rebound for the conference business but not the business travel. I think all the hotel owners of business hotels better start thinking about other uh, activities within their hotels, turning some of the rooms into residential, 
uh, you know, renting out for longer stays to people that uh, like the town itself, but to depend, as before, on the rack rate for business travelers who come two days and one day and three days and stuff, uh, that's going to be quite uh, unacceptable. Because if, if you, again, one of your employees tells you, uh, I'm going to Paris to meet uh, Mr. So-and-so because it's a very important client, you're going to tell him, what? Just Zoom him. Mm. That's enough. You don't need to travel, and uh, the company occurs, uh, incurs a cost of two, three thousand dollars. Just call him. Mm. Greg, you've just raised a fund, mm -hmm. 1.5 billion dollars, committed about 500 million across four different deals. Maybe a day or two behind. You may announce something okay. more. But tell me about what you're seeing and why those deals. So that's our distressed fund. That's the newest uh, fund in the family of funds. And it was, it was designed because starting in March of 2020, I was getting two or three calls a week from people who needed capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only had equity funds, and I didn't have a way to, in, to, to help them uh, with the rest of their capital structure. So we did two airline deals, a, um, a cruise deal, and a rental car deal. Mm -hmm. um, that allowed companies to have the working capital to last out the crisis. We're working with several governments now. The 1.5 billion represents the equity component. We can actually lever it from there. So we're working with a bunch of uh, governments right now to put in um, opportunity, tr like travel opportunity funds, where if you run a tour operator or you run a working capital intensive business, you can come, you can get a loan from us pretty quickly. Um, and so, uh, the reason we raised the billion five was really to, to chase after specific distressed opportunities and for companies who, whose equity, current equity value may be worth less than the debt that they have on them. So right. being able to help them restructure was important. And how important when they restructure, relaunch, Hertz for example, is the technological component? So on, on almost everything we do, you know, travel is a collection of you'd have to argue old economy businesses for the most part. I'm not saying all of them are, but many of them are old economy. And a lot of them haven't had technology investment for the better part of a decade. So whether it was American Express or Internova or TripAdvisor or, or Hertz, um, for instance, Hertz uh, will have a whole system revamp. Um, uh, you'll be able to, you know, in the fullness of time, you'll be able to take your phone out you won't have to go to a desk. You'll approach a car. You'll unlock the car with the phone. You'll get in. It'll have full telematics inside the car. Um, we'll do better job uh, pricing for yield, fleet assignment. A lot of the problems with the rental car industry is there isn't the right car in the right place. Uh, and then I think the big push over the next five years is, you know, we have traditionally we have 500,000 cars. We'll have 280 right now. Uh, what's unique right now is you can't buy new cars because there's right. this giant ship shortage. So we're having to make do with the cars we have. But as we start refleeting, we'll probably replace that with something like four or five hundred thousand electric vehicles. Hmm. Um, and we're working with different governments to have infrastructure. But there's a lot of governments that are really interested in the greening of their of their countries. And it's great to have electric vehicles. And it's nice consumers will pay more for the ele to rent electric vehicle. And, um, and they're cheaper to operate. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's better for the pro profit of the company, better for the environment, better for the consumer. Hussein, tell me how you're working with government as well. I'd love to hear how in the UAE, the private sector is helping build that road to recovery. I mean, no doubt that Dubai government, UAE government has done a fantastic job in the last few years, the last two decades, and especially the last 14, 15 months since COVID started, how Dubai really zoomed, as they say, boomed and zoomed, you know, with, with, with the zoom. They have shut down the country, two months very, very strict. I mean, I live on Palm. I could not step on the beach. They were that strict for two months. But then they opened the country slowly. And December, I never seen in my life, I've been in UAE all my life, especially in the last 20 years, how busy we were from tourism, from restaurants, uh, prices of property are going up, especially the villas. Where I live in Palm, property prices are going up by 50%. Mm. Uh, a lot of people from 
Europe, from Russia, CIS, India, China, coming to Dubai, not for holiday only, but to live there. People mostly from Europe realize the tax is going to be going up because all this borrowing of the, uh, and the expenditure of the governments, and a lot of them moving to Dubai because, and especially during COVID, the Dubai was open, they never thought of the city in that content. So they came and they find it safe, and they find it friendly, and they find it very service-oriented. So really, Dubai is one of the cities that benefited the most in the world from the COVID, I think. And how easy is it to choose what you're going to invest in? I imagine you've got a desk full of investments. What are the, what's really catching your eye? Hmm. Dubai is a very competitive city. It's a very competitive market. So you have to be very careful. Uh, there are people who are there for businesses for generations and from around the world. So you have the best jewelers from Beirut and from India and from Belgium operating and so forth in textile and every industry. So you have to be very careful what to invest in. It, it could look to you beautiful and you could lose a lot of money. But the people who know their business, they know their, what they're doing, they make a good amount of money. But it's a very mature, uh, sophisticated, well-regulated market. Sammy, tell me what's on your mind. I know that you think a lot about co-investment, for example. How can we encourage governments to partner with people like you? Well, I think the road to recovery of the private sector, the traditional private sector involvement uh, in investments to like grow the country's uh, tourism sector or real estate sector uh, is going to continue to suffer. That's why, for example, he could raise a fund like this, because mm. guys like us are not making a lot of uh, surplus, which traditionally we would just reinvest. Mm. So even though we're bombarded with opportunities from left, right, and center, but we don't have our own resources, not to mention even greenfield projects. Mm. Because, you know, in many cases you have opportunities that are far below replacement cost popping up from right, left, and center, and then you ask yourself, why would I start something new when I could get a distressed asset, fix it in no time, and run it? You know, like uh, uh, <coughs> a very good example is my uh, travel company. You know, I have uh, this uh, German tour operator that we took over during the crisis, and these guys are bombarded by their clients. They move five million tourists every year, so you can imagine that all the hotel owners are begging f for clients now that the COVID is starting to, to be over. And of course, under normal circumstances, uh, we would be taking up these chances to like, uh, invest in these hotels partially or wholly or uh, whatever. And now, of course, we've had uh, one and a half years with zero clients almost. <laughs> And you know, from five million to like six, seven hundred thousand, you can imagine the accumulated overheads, the, the the all the debt that we had to take on just to survive. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes and says, "Please be my partner." We tell him, "Sorry, we don't have money." Yeah. So even for greenfield projects, where a lot of governments are now uh, very eager to attract new investors, uh, they will find that most of us are not really able to put aside the amounts that uh, would be needed for such fresh investments. So unless governments actually get engaged with private sector players that come with their connections, with their know-how, with their experience, to do it with them, uh, it will remain a government-sponsored industry, which is obviously not uh, the correct way forward. You know, there's nothing better than having someone's own personal money involved in a project so that you can sleep because he won't sleep. <laughs> I, I want to make sure you have my number for all those opportunities you're not investing in, Sammy. You know. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, I didn't realize about this story. I was, it was on my mind to have to talk. <laughs> okay. I, because it really very often, nowadays, I'm, I'm like, it's sad. I always say, like, imagine if you had the same cash flow that you had two years ago, how many amazing opportunities you would have picked up. Mm. Now one has to be so stingy with the investment money because it's, uh, you have a lot of opportunities 
and uh, you don't have the, the heart to take the cash out of a company that's not really making a lot of money these days. Mm. You know? I wanted to talk about airlines, Greg, because you've taken on two, I believe, in the last mm -hmm. few months. Now, this is a pretty worried industry, but it is absolutely necessary to get the, move, uh, the world moving again. What do you think the biggest change is going to be in terms of where you're putting your money and therefore where the airlines will be investing? So air, the two airlines we invested in were, I think, one of the largest shareholders of Azul, and we did the dip financing for LATAM. Um, Latin America had different... Azul's man, Brazil, is that right? Azul's Brazil, mm -hmm. yeah. Latin America had a different distressed opportunity. And what's interesting about airlines is there's all kinds of ways to lose money and there's all kinds of ways to make money in an airline. I'm looking to see if Akbar's no, Akbar's not here so I can talk about airlines because otherwise we'd have to ask him. He's smarter than I am. Um, w one of the things that happened in Latin America is inside of, this is anecdotal, but inside the, uh, of every aircraft there's seats and there's cargo. And what happened is as they reduced the amount of, of uh, seats available, the price on cargo went way, way up at the same time. So, so what ended up happening is in Latin America, you fly perishables north and you fly durables south. So the cargo planes are loaded both ways. So the, my investment are both secured investments. They're secured by the cargo businesses of, the air, of those airlines. And the cargo businesses in 2020 made four times what they made in 2019. So it was an easy investment to make. If, if we flew the passengers around, around for free, which, which if anyone's listening in Latin America, we're not doing that. Right. But, but if we flew them around for free, we would, we would have done well. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the secular trends, we heard them today, everyone's right, wellness is a secular trend. Um, Mr. Swiri owns a, a beautiful resort in Switzerland uh, called Andermatt, and, and it has a great hotel, great spas, outdoor activities. All, I'm selling it for you, Sammy. So. Um, uh, uh, and, and so things like that, destinations like that are gonna be, are, are gonna be um, correct. My colleague here said that people are gonna go to, they're gonna stay away from cities and go to resorts and things like that, and that's gonna be destination tourism. We're seeing a huge pickup on that. Um, uh, like, for instance, in the United States, try to rent a car in the United States anywhere that, they're all sold out every weekend all the time. You can't, can't rent them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think wellness will be a big thing, destination, activities, um, you know, and, and, then, and then I think people who are going to get capital and people who are going to get tourists are the people, I don't know how everyone else said it, I require, it's, I say it like certainty, right? So for instance, like if you had told me, all due respect to the rest of the EU, if you had told me that three years ago that Greece was going to be the shining example economic and fiscal discipline and, um, and, and could manage through a crisis like this, I would have said never. So the Prime Minister and Harry and those people have done a great job. So we're seeing Croatia, Iceland, Greece for this summer bookings off the chart. And the only thing those people have in common is that they, you know exactly uh, what you need to do to get there and you can do it and you can come back and they can charge almost anything they want. Mm. And so I think there's a lot of capital that are gonna go to governments, to, to Mr. Sweary's point, um, to, that are gonna go to governments that can provide certainty and, and sensibility to the traveling public. If you do that, you'll get the visitors. And we're seeing that in Saudi and UAE. UAE did the same thing. Like, it might be difficult to get in and out of Dubai, but you know what you have to do, you know what you have to test, you know the, down, the app you have to download, so people go. It's also this idea of digital nomads, right? I can work from home, so why don't I come and work in Andermatt or in Dubai? What can governments do along with the private sector to encourage people to do that? To encourage to work from home? Well, but from Dubai. So if I live in London, why do I need to stay in London? I could move to Dubai for six months. They want your money. <laughs> I mean, the, some of the decision Dubai government or UAE government has taken in the last two, 12 months were amazing and were shocked to me, even though I live in that country and I was born there. For the last 10 years, the debate was going on that foreigners can own 100% LLC company. It was not allowed, only 49. They took a decision six months ago, foreigners can own 100%. That's a mega decision because we have surveyed around the world and looking for a place where you register a company 
where you pay zero taxes and own 100 percent, and there is none. Uh, Ireland, you pay 12 percent. Luxembourg, you pay 7, 10, 12 percent or dividend tax. Dubai has zero dividend tax, zero corporate tax, and now you can register your company 100 percent, which is a major decision. Another decision they have taken, they are now giving passport to a lot of people who have been in Dubai for more than 20 years, which was never happened before. Apart from, of course, you can buy your own house and freehold and all that. So from that point of view, Dubai is very much welcoming foreigners and other people feeling very comfortable. I have met dozens of people in the last uh, six months from different parts of the world. They're moving their families and they're buying homes in Dubai and moving their businesses. Thank you so much. We're out of time. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time talking about investment in the future of real estate and tourism. And next up, I am delighted to hand over to Jane Witherspoon. And she is from, she's the Bureau Chief in Dubai, Bureau News.